Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Want to uh, welcome you to our, our Hurricane Ian edition of our Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are thankful that we are able to be here and and you know um, to still be able to come together. <laughs> and I'm sure you know that has something to do with uh, <clears throat> people not being able to reach out. But hey, where two or three are gathered in His name, right? <laughs> so. We're going to uh, go ahead and uh, get started. So welcome again. And uh, Brother Earl, uh, go ahead and open us in a word of prayer, please. Let's pray. Almighty God, we want to thank you. Not hearing you, Brother Earl. Probably doesn't realize he's muted. Yeah. We'll let him finish. Amen. Hey, brother, we, we, we missed about 80% of it. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure we heard this the start and then it's like your your mic went or something. You're not muted, but... Um, uh, I'm trying, I'm right, trying there you to go, see there you go. Can... You're back now. Yeah, I was trying. Right. Down again. All right, no problem, no problem. Thank you very much, Brother Earl. Um, I know those of us here, we, you know, how we uh, go forward. Um, if you have any questions or anything, you just raise your hand or use a little icon as we go forward. And uh, I'll turn over to uh, Reverend Chisholm as we continue our uh, study of Genesis. And right. So we're in session five this evening. I'll give you a guys a break. Uh, next week, we'll look at the existence of God, nature's evidence, which is not out of line with the Genesis Academy series. But we'll take a break next week from the Academy series and go into my public lecture, The Existence of God, Nature's Evidence. So we get cracking tonight on session five. You're going to share, right, Rev? Go ahead. I'm not hearing you. Sorry. Girl. Say again? You have the video material. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. You sent it today, right? No, when I sent it days ago. Days, all right. Okay, okay, I'm hearing you guys. All right, mm. good. I hear this. Two parts. Uh, did you guys finish up my prayer? For me? <laughs> yeah, we said amen. We took it by faith. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God is good. <laughs> he is every time. What? Uh, 
Sorry, Rev. It's saying it, the file does not exist. Mm -hmm. it's, t it's telling me, it's, it's, I tried to open it here and it says file does not exist. File does not exist? Yeah, sorry, the file you have requested does not exist. Oh, Lord. Let me, let me go back. Let's see. That's crazy. And it's number five. Yeah. I'm trying to see. Yeah, I, I did it on my phone too and it gives me the same thing. All right, let me let me put in the the DVD. Okay. Okay, I sent it to the computer here and it came, but then I try and I click on it, it goes to the Google, but then it, it doesn't open it. Yeah. Let me see if I can sometimes give me a little challenge to get it slid into the DVD player, but let me try. Okay. That's not too bad. So we have to bring it down and then Yeah, sorry, I with every I didn't even get to check my email the past like you know week. I have like four hundred emails there. <laughs> So what I need to do is get out of this share screen and select it. All right, give me one sec. Share audio. Oh yeah, I need to share audio indeed, right. All right, so select, share, and play. Yep, there it is. Welcome back to the Genesis Academy. Last time you would have heard about days two and three, which is the creation of the rakia, the expanse, the continents, and the vegetation. But one thing you haven't seen yet is the creation of the sun. So how was there a day-night cycle? Well, the simple explanation here is that you have a rotating earth and the light created on day one. That's where you get the day and night cycle. But one thing not yet created was the sun. So how do we have a day and night cycle? It's because God created light on day one and he already had the earth rotating on its axis once a day. There is your day and night cycle. But on day four, God created the sun, moon and stars to take over the job of producing the light on the earth. So let's look at the verses. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth to rule over the day and over the night and to separate light from the darkness. And then day four closes and God saw that it was good. God objectively assessed the creation as good once again. And there's evening and there's morning, a fourth day. These are clearly ordinary 24 hour days. And the luminaries, the light bearers, were there to give time measurements for us on Earth. Like, for instance, day, I've already explained, before the sun there was a day, is a one rotation of the Earth around its axis. And a year, now we can talk about a year, now that we have the sun, because a year is one revolution of the Earth around the sun. Now, what about seasons, though? Uh, no, seasons are caused by the Earth's axial tilt. 
See, what happens is that the side tilted towards the sun actually has more direct sunlight on it. So there's more energy per, for a given amount of area. So there's more heat and light on the Earth during summer months when the Earth's axis is tilted towards the sun. And also the days are longer during summer, so there's more time for the Earth to heat up on that side and less time at night to cool down. And the opposite is at winter time. So the seasons are not caused by different distances from the sun, but by the actual tilt, about 23 and a half degrees. So here we start with the northern winter and the southern summer in December. So you see how the southern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun and the Earth is away from the sun. And then we go throughout the year. March is actually you've got spring in the north and autumn in the south. Next one we have June, which is actually where we have the northern summer, but it's winter in the southern hemisphere. So another thing you can tell from Genesis, since seasons were there from day four, it means the Earth's axis must have been tilted from day four. So it's a false idea that God created the Earth straight upward and something else tilted it later. No, the Earth must have had a tilt for seasons to exist uh, from day four, as Genesis tells you. Okay, you may have heard about the Galileo Affair, how it was a big battle between science and religion. Well, this is in fact not true. And here is an expert, Giorgio de Santillana, who wrote a whole book on the area. And he said it has been known for a long time that a major part of the church's intellectuals were on the side of Garrido, but the clearest opposition to him came from the secular ideas. So in fact, the Galileo issue was in fact science versus science not science versus religion. The science of the day at the universities were following the Ptolemaic view, uh, which had the Earth at the center of the universe, and Galileo's view was challenging the science of the day. Rather like creation challenges the science of our day, of long ages and evolution. So that's a lesson to learn uh, from this whole um, affair in history was in fact the church made the mistake of aligning with the science of its day as opposed to what the Bible tells you. Now the Bible does tell you things about the sun rises and sunsets, but don't we say the same thing today? Because we have to specify a reference frame. All motion is in relation to something else and it's convenient for us on earth to talk about sunrise and sunset. It's actually quite hard for us to say that our line of sight to the sun is tangential to the horizon. It's much easier to say sunset. And this is well known uh, in ancient times, this, this concept of the reference frame, because here is a very famous uh, book, the Aeneid, well known in the Middle Ages. And one passage, he says, we set out from harbor and the land and cities recede. You see, he's on the boat, so as far as the observer on the boat is concerned is the lands and cities that are moving away from us as opposed to the, the boat moving, which is what we would say. So they understood in those days the idea of relative motion. So a couple of centuries before Galileo was born, we had clergy scientists in the Middle Ages who also discussed this idea of reference frame, like Buridan and Oraim and the Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa, who were all in good standing with the church, who actually discussed the idea of what would we expect to see if the earth was moving rather than everything else revolving around it. Now, nowadays, you guys drive cars, and often, instead of getting a, a huge map out, you have your GPS. And what's the GPS? That gives you a car-centered reference frame and has all the streets moving around you. And the point here is that you can choose whatever reference frame you want to. Now, if we're discussing the solar system as a whole, it's much easier to use the sun as the reference frame and the planets moving in elliptical orbits around it. So it's all a matter of reference frames. Now let's get on to the huge variety of things that God created in the heavens. And in fact, Paul, in his great chapter on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, he actually makes a reference to Genesis 1 to give a theological point about the resurrection. He goes to the history of Genesis 1. 
Uh, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, the glory of the earthly is of another kind, and there's one glory of the sun, another of the moon, another of the stars, and star differs from star in glory. So he's actually referring to exactly the things that God created during creation week on day four here. He expects his readers to understand this. He expects them to have been taught this right from the beginning of the church. They were taught about Genesis 1 and what God created on those days. So let's look at our own solar system first. Now, just to let you know, it's a very pretty picture, but the sun and the planets are not to scale in either size or in distance, especially not in distance. Okay, let's see what happens if I try to draw the distances and sizes of scale. I mean, look how tiny even the Earth and the Moon would be if I try to draw them to scale. And the Sun is 400 times further away still than that. And Neptune, the furthest planet, 30 times further than that. And the nearest star outside our solar system is 9,000 times further apart than that. So you see why it's just not possible to draw uh, the solar system to scale. So we have to stylize a bit. Otherwise, you'd see almost nothing there. OK, now let's look, compare our sun with some other stars around. Now, there are lots of different varieties of stars, as Paul told us. In fact, the sun is in the top 10% of all stars, because most stars are actually red dwarfs, like this one here, about a tenth of the mass of the sun, and you can't even see them without a telescope. But there are some very big stars. That light blue one here, that's a general, ordinary blue star. It's quite a lot bigger and more massive than the sun. But uh, there's a huge bright blue star called R136A1. It's incredibly massive, 300 times more massive than the sun, and it's 9 million times brighter. So if it was as close as Alpha Centauri, the closest star to us outside our own solar system, it would be as bright as the full moon. That's how bright the star is. Now, there are actually larger stars. The red supergiants are actually larger. Hypergiants are larger, but this is the most massive star we have and the brightest star we know. Now, here's another argument you may have heard. It's been going for the last century or more, that the Earth is insignificant. I'll just give you one example uh, from Bill Nye, who used to play a science guy on children's television. And here is his Humanist of the Year speech. He said, I'm insignificant. I'm just another speck of sand. And the Earth and the cosmic scene of things is just another speck. And the sun is an unremarkable star. The galaxy is a speck. I'm a speck on a speck orbiting a speck among other specks, among still other specks in the middle of specklessness. I suck. Well, OK, he said it, not me. But how true is this, though? Well, let's look at the uh, unremarkable star thing. Well, I've already explained to you that the sun is in the top 10% of all stars. But it's also in a very good location in the galaxy. It's called the co-rotation radius. And this is where the stars and the spiral arm it's in go at the same rotational speed, so it stays in the same position in the spiral arm and doesn't cross and get exposed to collisions with other stars. So it's an ideal radius. You see, we wouldn't want to be in the center of a galaxy because that's where a black hole is to suck us in. Now, surveys of galaxies, enormous large-scale surveys of galaxies have indicated that we have these concentric shells of galaxies where galaxies seem to be clustered at discrete distances from the Earth. Now, this pattern's only observable if our galaxy is at or near the center of the universe. Now, this pattern of galaxies goes against the Big Bang theory, because the Big Bang starts with an assumption that there is no center to the universe. But this pattern shows there is a center near our galaxy. Now, what about Bill Nye's other argument that the Earth is insignificant. Well, in fact, 
the tiny size of the Earth has been common knowledge for 2,000 years. And go back to Ptolemy in the 2nd century AD. He said the Earth, in relation to the distance of the fixed stars, has no appreciable size and must be treated as a mathematical point. So this was standard knowledge throughout the Middle Ages. The, the Earth was incredibly tiny compared to the vastness of space. So Bill Nye is saying nothing that we haven't known for 2,000 years. And then when you go into the Middle Ages itself, uh, we see uh, Boethius. You've heard from the demonstrations of the astronomers that in comparison to the vastness of the heavens, it's agreed that the whole extent of the Earth has a value of a mere point. And this was the consolation of philosophy, one of the most widely read books in the entire Middle Ages. So you can be sure that all the educated clergy knew that the Earth was tiny compared to the rest of the cosmos. This was standard knowledge. Bill Nye acts as though he's saying something that was only discovered by modern science. Well, no, the church has always known that the Earth is tiny. But really, uh, so what if it's tiny? I mean, what is size anyway? I mean, do we have to say that a five-foot man is less valuable than a six-foot man? I mean, size does not equal importance. The Earth is the most important part for God's plan working out through history. Okay, so why did God create so much? Well, I think one reason is explained in the Psalms. The heavens declare the glory of God, the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Well, I think here is the reason that God created such a vast cosmos. The heavens declare the glory of God. That's what it's doing. It's declaring God's majesty. The, the expanse of the heavens uh, show how great God is. And then we also have uh, this passage here uh, saying how important the earth is. He formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord. There is no other. So this is where the earth is where Adam was created, the head, the federal head of the rest of creation, and where God became man in the incarnation. That also happened on earth, nowhere else in the universe. Now let's go to the other things God created during day four. Well, first of all, the greater light, the sun. It's the right color, you see, because a red star wouldn't have the right sort of light for photosynthesis to power of the vegetation that was created on day three. And if it's too blue, there's too much ultraviolet, which is very damaging to life. And the sun is the right size as well, because a, a large star tends to be a blue star. If it's too massive, which again has a problem of too much radiation. And if it's a small star, the Earth would have to be too close to it, which means that the star would lock the rotation, so you'd have only one face of the planet towards the sun. Another thing about the star, of what we call the sun, is that it's an incredibly stable star. Other stars, even stars which are like the sun, are nowhere near as stable as our sun is. I mean, other stars throw off these very damaging flares that could take out a planet's atmosphere. The sun is incredibly stable, so it's not an insignificant star. It's a very well-designed star for life on Earth. Okay, how old is the sun then? Well, the Bible tells us that he created it on day four after the Earth. Of course, the Big Bang tells you the sun is older than the Earth, but that can't be right. And in fact, we have evidence in the sun that it can't be as old as the five billion years the secular people claim. Evidence for this is called the faint young sun paradox. Now, the point is the sun is powered by nuclear fusion. Now, this means that light atoms are coming together to form heavy ones. So you're having hydrogen atoms, four of them coming together and forming one helium nucleus. And that releases lots and lots of energy, like a hydrogen bomb. Now, four particles to one particle means there's less in the core, which means the core is contracting with age, which means the fusion reaction is getting stronger. Now, this means that the sun is becoming hotter and brighter with age. Now, when you go back billions of years of this, it means the sun would have been too cool to support life, would have a frozen earth. 
And yet, the secular paleontologists tell us that the Earth was, if anything, was warmer in those days. But the sun would have been quite a lot cooler in those days. Now, this is not a problem on a few thousand years time scale, but it's a huge problem for the billions of years time scale. So how do evolutionists believe that the sun was formed? The idea is called the nebula hypothesis. Nebula meaning a cloud. So you've got a cloud of dust and gas, and it supposedly contracts on its own gravity and eventually forms the sun and the planets. Now, there's a huge problem with that. The sun has uh, about 99.9% of the mass of the solar system but it has only about 2% of the angular momentum. Now, angular momentum is the mass times the speed times the distance from the center. And there's a law in science called the law of conservation of angular momentum. So as, as the mass comes in, the distances are getting smaller. Therefore, to keep momentum constant, they have to speed up. And we can see this. You may have seen pictures of ice skaters pulling their arms in. I'll show you a, a video of one. Now, you see as she, she is uh, spinning around quite fast, she gets her speed up, but then she brings her arms in, and then you can see how much faster she is spinning. And this is the law of conservation of angular momentum at work, that as the, the arms come in, she spins much faster. So the sun should be spinning really, really fast under this idea, but in fact, it's spinning really, really slowly. So the evolutionary idea can't be right. The Bible's idea makes far more sense. Now, another young age indicator in our solar system is the comet. Now, comets are dirty snowballs, and they're not very big, really. Now, we see them because when they get close to the sun, the sun evaporates some of the ice, and it forms a vapor and iron trail, and the solar wind pushes the tails away from the sun. So the tail is always pointing away from the sun, as you can see here. But this means that every time the comet goes past the sun and we see it so bright in the sky, it's losing part of itself. So after a number of passes around the sun, we'd expect the comets to evaporate and we wouldn't see them anymore. But clearly we do see comets, which means they haven't been around long enough to evaporate um, completely. And this would put an upper limit of the age of a solar system to about 10,000 years at the most. This is an upper limit and not the actual age. Okay, now let's look at the lesser light which is also known as the moon. And the moon has a very important uh, function, and one of them is the tides. Now, Bede, I mentioned earlier, realized that the moon had the main role in creating the tides. Galileo got that part wrong. Now, what happens is the moon is going around the Earth, and its gravitational pull uh, pulls part of it towards it, and the part away is, is not being attracted so strong, and also squeezes the stuff in from the side, the ocean in from the sides, and that's why you get a bulge on either side of the Earth as the moon is going around, and over here you've got a low tide, here's the high tide towards the moon. Okay, and the moon is very useful because it cleanses the ocean's shorelines, um, keeps ocean currents circulating, uh, stops the ocean from stagnating. Uh, they benefit man by scouring up the shipping channels. They dilute the sewage discharges into the ocean. So very useful function having a very big moon quite close to the earth is forming these tides. Okay, how did the moon form according to evolution? They really don't know. They've proposed a number of different ideas, but none of them seem to work. Uh, one idea is that the moon was captured from something else. But the thing is, when you look at the planetary dynamics, see, if a moon was captured from far away, then we'd expect the orbit to be very elliptical like the comets are. But instead, the moon's orbit is very circular. Now, another theory is called the fission theory, where you have the Earth spinning and the centrifugal force pushes out some of it, and that's what formed the moon. This was proposed by George Darwin, the son of Charles. Now, the problem is, if the moon is close to the Earth, it will be shattered by tidal forces, so it really couldn't get out there without being shattered. Another idea is that a huge impact happened 
a planet the size of Mars or more banged into the Earth and uh, the, the debris form the, the current Earth and the current moon, but this has some problems as well, including uh, the angular momentum problem once again. Now, the moon is also receding from us. It's getting slightly further away. We know this because people went to the moon. They put uh, some um, retro reflectors on the moon, which can bounce back lasers, so we can actually measure it from laser pulses. And we find the moon is receding at about four centimeters per year. That's the average of since it's getting bigger. Now, this is very understandable because when the moon is causing tides, the, the Earth is also pulling on the moon and it's pulling the moon a little bit further away in the orbit, you see. So when you do the mathematics, you find that this effect is quite strongly dependent on the closeness to it. So the closer it gets, the stronger this effect is. So when you draw the, draw the maths, you start from today and then you try and plot backwards over billions of years and you find it can't get more than about 1.4 billion years ago before the moon is touching the Earth. So that rules out the four and a half billion year time frame for the Earth-Moon system that evolutionists have often been teaching you, okay? And the problem is, if the moon was not quite this close and not even touching, it would be shattered before it even gets there but they believe the moon and earth system is four and a half billion years old. Another very interesting coincidence is that the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon and it's also 400 times further away. And this leads to the spectacular total eclipses. And during the eclipse, you can see it's the sun's, sun's atmosphere and also the sun's corona, okay? And this is only possible when the sun and moon are very closely coordinated in size and distance. Now, the thing is, if the moon had been receding for millions of years, how amazing it is that we're just in the right time to be able to see the total eclipses. You see, if we're a bit further away, all we'd see was the ring, the annular eclipse. We'd never see this nice total eclipse. And if, it was, uh, if the moon was closer to us, uh, then it would block out the sun's corona as well. It wouldn't look as nice as this. Only in this time uh, is that uh, coincidence possible of 400 times bigger and 400 times further away. And quite clearly, you can see from this picture that it really is the moon that's blocking the sun. Now, what else did God make in day four? Well, he made the stars also, which almost looks like it's an afterthought. And, and this is a, a figure of speech to say that even though these stars are massive, distant uh, to God, uh, they're almost no expense at all. Didn't cause them any strain whatsoever. What's really complicated is making the DNA and protein of the fish to feed the 5,000. That's a real uh, amazing miracle. Now, again, evolutionists have a problem with star formation. Here is uh, one popular evolutionary astronomer, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He said, not all gas clouds in the Milky Way can form stars at all times. More often than not, the clouds confuse about what to do. Astrophysicists are the ones confused here. We know the cloud wants to collapse under its own weight to make one or more stars, and turbulent motion in the cloud work against that fate. So does ordinary gas pressure. You see, the gas pressure is trying to make the cloud expand and not contract. Galactic magnetic fields also fight collapse. The scary part is that if none of us knew in advance that stars existed, frontline research would offer plenty of convincing reasons why stars could never form. They certainly could not form under the naturalistic view of collapsing gas clouds. And it seems that some of the star formation theories always presuppose pre-existing stars, like a supernova blew up and compressed the gas cloud. But hang on, to get a supernova, you had to have a star. So where did that star come from? And that is a problem for star formation. Now, also stars are usually grouped in galaxies with billions of stars. And there's a problem for galaxy formation as well, because supposedly with the Big Bang idea, the further away something is, you're looking further back in the past, which means you're looking further back closer to the Big Bang time. So it means the further back you go, the closer you are to the Big Bang. 
But he's saying here, we expect to find basically zero massive galaxies beyond about 9 billion years ago because theoretical models predict that massive galaxies form last. Instead, we find highly developed galaxies that shouldn't have been there, which means how could they have had time to form under the Big Bang scenario? They shouldn't have been able to form at this early stage in the universe's history. So this is a huge problem uh, for Big Bang ideas. Now let's go into design aspects, but this time the cosmos as a whole. Now one thing to think about is the famous Goldilocks story. She comes into this house with the bears, and the father's porridge is too hot, the mother's is too cold, but the baby's porridge is just right. And same with the bed, the baby bed is just right, it's not too hard and not too soft. And therefore, astronomers talk about a Goldilocks zone around stars, also called the habitable zone, which is this blue here. Now, the sun's habitable zone, obviously the Earth is in it, and it's not too cold, so water would all freeze, and not too hot, so water would all boil. It's the right place for water to be liquid, which is essential for life. Okay, here is a habitable zone of a red dwarf star, which of course has to be much closer to the star, uh, for water to be liquid. But the problem is that sort of closeness means that the gravity is so strong there that the planet has one side always facing the star. So one side's perpetual day and the other side is perpetual night. Another thing is those stars tend to emit very dangerous flares that would wipe out any atmosphere and probably any life on the planet. And uh, they also suffer from enormous star spots, which would cover about 40% of the, of the star surface, again, cutting out what little light it already emits. Now, we can go even further than the star and the solar system to the universe's fundamental constants. And by the way, the, this is a picture of actual atoms here. Now, when it comes to the universe, there are fundamental forces, like for instance, the electromagnetic force. Again, if it's too weak, then atoms couldn't form. The proton wouldn't be strong enough uh, to attract the electrons. But if it's too strong, uh, molecules couldn't form because the protons would attract the electrons too strongly. So either way, you wouldn't have life. And this is not about uh, what we know about life. This is actually life itself couldn't form because molecules or atoms couldn't form. Okay, what's another one? Uh, electrons to proton mass, again, have to be exactly right. The proton is almost 2,000 times heavier than the electron. And again, if it's too large or too small, molecules couldn't form. No molecules could form, which means no life could form. Doesn't matter what life you think existed. Uh, if molecules can't form, then life can't form. So this is foundational uh, to fine tuning of the universe. Another aspect goes to our planet, which again has amazing fine tuning. There's so many things uh, which are just right. Goldilocks features of the Earth, like the gravity is neither too large or too small. Uh, the Earth's axial tilt means we have seasons. Uh, see, if it was vertical, it would have very uh, cold poles and very hot equators, you see, so much more extremes of temperature. Another one is the rotation period, the day length, you see. If it's too uh, fast or too slow, it just wouldn't be good for us. We have a magnetic field uh, which helps to protect the atmosphere from damaging uh, charged particles that stream from the sun. So it's a very good design feature. And even the thickness of our crust is good. Uh, the ratio of oxygen to nitrogen in the atmosphere this is about a one to four. Again, too much oxygen would mean you'd almost never be able to put out a fire and too little be very hard to support people like us who need oxygen to breathe. Another one, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and ozone levels are just, again, very good things. We need to have some greenhouse gases uh, to stop the Earth freezing overnight. The Earth would be about 30 degrees cooler without uh, carbon dioxide and water vapor to trap infrared. We, uh, the greenhouse effect is good for us. Now, 
One question that you often come across, and maybe one of the most common questions I get during question and answer time, is this one. If the universe is 6,000 years old, how can we see light from distant stars? And the issue here is there are a lot of stars that are further away than 6,000 light years. Now, first of all, let's remind us, a light year is a measure of distance, not time. It's the distance that light would travel in one year at its current speed through a vacuum. That's what a light year is. One thing the critics often overlooked is that big bangers have their own problem with light travel time. In other words, they have more light years than years available even under their time scale. There's too little time for light to do what it needs to do. And the issue here is called the horizon problem. Now, first of all, I explain what happens. Close to the Big Bang, you have this explosion, in, in quote marks, really. Uh, and what we have is these points here are going to be very different in temperature. You can't escape that. They're going to be different temperatures. But later on, we find that the temperature of the microwave background radiation is almost uniform. Now, how do you get uniform temperatures? Well, you have to have energy going from the hot things to the cold things. And the fastest this can happen is the speed of light. And yet, there hasn't been time for light to go from point A to point B. The maximum distance here is the horizon. You can't see past the horizon. So light can't have got past this horizon to reach point B and equalize the temperatures. That is why it's called the horizon problem. Now here is uh, a typical cosmic microwave background map. And the thing is, uh, the temperature is so uniform, about one part in 100,000, okay? And that is very hard to explain under a Big Bang model. So here's an admission from an evolutionary publication, you scientists. This horizon problem is a big headache for cosmologists. So big, they've come up with some pretty wild solutions. Inflation, for example. You can solve the horizon problem by having the universe expand ultra-fast for a time, just after the Big Bang, blowing up by a factor of 10 to the 50th in 10 to the minus 33 seconds. But is that just wishful thinking? I think it may well be. Now here is a promoter, the originator of inflation, called Alan Guth. And the point is, he's talking about the universe itself expanding much, much faster than the speed of light. Okay, so you can't escape. Something is going faster than light here, uh, but they've got no mechanism for starting or stopping this faster than light expansion, and it would require gravity running in reverse. And that's why the Big Bang has come under secular assault. Now, one leading uh, opponent of the Big Bang is Eric Lerner, and he objects to it because it relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities that we can't observe, inflation, dark matter, and dark energy. And the point is, without them, there'd be a fatal contradiction between the observations and the predictions of the Big Bang theory. And for instance, the inflation, supposedly to rescue the horizon problem, requires a density 20 times larger than that implied by Big Bang nuclear synthesis, the theory's explanation of the origin of the light elements, you see. So there are problems here, and that's why he was one of the signatories to a letter uh, from prominent cosmologists saying that we should not be accepting the Big Bang. So here's a lesson for us, you see. I think there are too many well-meaning Christian apologists who want to marry uh, their theology to the Big Bang theory. The problem is they will be widowed tomorrow if cosmologists reject the Big Bang. Now, another idea to solve the horizon problem is that light was much faster in the past by 60 orders of magnitude. So it's one followed by 60 zeros. That's how much faster he's proposing that light once traveled. Now, creationists once proposed something like that 30 or 40 years ago and were attacked as scientific heretics. How dare we talk about decreasing light speed uh, to rescue the book of Genesis? But apparently it's okay to propose exactly the same thing in principle to rescue the Big Bang. 
Now, there are a number of different creation solutions to the horizon problem, which sometimes mimics the evolutionary solution. Now, one very important category is to note from general relativity by Einstein that gravity slows down time. And, and the very precise atomic clocks have actually measured the slowdown near the Earth's sea level, where gravity is stronger, closer to the Earth's center, compared to mountains, where it's a bit faster. And in fact, our GPS or sat-nav systems, which rely on satellites, they have to take into account that the satellites are in a weaker gravitational field, so the time is a little bit faster, but it's only uh, 38 microseconds per day, but that would actually have to be taken into account. Otherwise, your navigation would go wrong by 40 meters every hour. So it is a real effect, gravity slowing down time. And one cosmological model by uh, Dr. Russell Humphreys, you've got Dr. John Hartn, who's proposed something similar, is that during creation week, where you have Earth being created and the expanse happening, you're going to have a much slower gravity on Earth compared to gravity further away from it. So the thing is, Genesis 1, the days of creation week, are measured from Earth clocks, you see. So we believe six literal days according to Earth clocks, while the gravitational clocks are much, much faster during the expansion uh, during day two through to day four of creation week. I could do a whole talk on just the distant satellite problems that creationists have proposed, uh, but I can't do that now. But what I will do is explain that in my commentary on which the series is based, I have a part of chapter six is devoted to uh, creationist solutions to this problem and also why evolutionists have the same problem. Okay, as I've shown you, we've seen the design from the very largest scale of the cosmos to the subatomic particle level from the very tiniest to the very, very largest. Well, I hope you've learned a lot of exciting new things in this video. Uh, let's look at some of the things. First of all, God created the light bearers on day four, and this means the Earth is three days older than the sun and the stars, contrary to Big Bang ideas. Also, there's a huge variety of sizes and shapes in the heavens, and that shows God's glory as creator. And there's no conflict with science. The Bible does not teach faulty science like flat earth or absolute geocentrism. And the sun, moon, and stars, and galaxies are very good evidence for creation. They're against evolution. And finally, we have the earth, the sun, and the universe as a whole are ideal for man to live on earth. And evolutionists also have this distant satellite problem. They keep on throwing at us. However, when they do that, there's three fingers pointing back at themselves because they have exactly the same problem in principle with distant satellite called the horizon problem. So I hope you've enjoyed it so far and be sure to come for the next session where you'll be learning about the different animals God created on days five and six. Thank you for watching the Genesis Academy. All right, guys, quite a bit technical, maybe over your heads, like over mine as well. <laughs> what I'm going to do next week, actually, as he was going through, I have a simpler DVD, which I'll do before my existence of God, nature's evidence. So I'll show you the privileged planet. It's easier to appreciate the beauty, the centrality, and the cruciality of Earth as a privileged planet. Not an accidental, not an incidental, not an un, un, unimportant planet at all. I'll show you that DVD next week, God willing, and then we'll pick up the following Wednesday on the existence of God. While you're thinking of any questions you might have, let me just indulge. Some of you might pick up that I'm quite a clown at heart. I'm going to show you a humorous piece now with Fred Kitt on... <laughs> And what scientists talk about uh, black hole. So let me let me just find that, and you'll thoroughly enjoy. It. You, if you're laughing yourself silly, don't be embarrassed at all. Laughter is biblical.
then I saw this in the paper, almost skipped over it, then I went back and looked at it a little closer. I think this proves conclusively that scientists are making stuff up. In the newspaper, scientists said they discovered a black hole in the galaxy M87, 50 million light years away. That's what they said. They discovered a black hole in the galaxy M87, which I'm pretty sure is between M88 and M86. <laughs> 50 million light years away. That's how far away they said it was. 50 million light years. Light years. Light years! <laughs> well, you know what? I am sick and tired of acting like I know how far a light year is. <laughs> I have no idea. Is it farther than a mile? But they're more than happy to tell us, scientists said a light year is a distance light travels. Light travels, I've never even seen it peck! <laughs> they said a light year is a distance light travels in one year, which is approximately six trillion miles. Six trillion miles. Trillion! There's a number I use in my checking account every day. <laughs> so 50 million times six trillion. Way over a hundred! <laughs> so now we know how far to go, we know in which direction, just follow the numbers in the sky and there it is, a black hole. Of course, we all know what that is, don't we? We have no idea. But scientists are more than happy to tell us. Scientists said a black hole is a supernova or giant star that is so large it collapses onto itself and is so dense, the gravity is so powerful that even light can't escape. That's what the scientists said, even light can't escape. And this is where we've got them. They're making stuff up. <laughs> Even light can't escape. Because you know what they said that means? You can't see it. <laughs> oh no, you should all be with me at this point. <laughs> you can't see it, but we discovered it! 50 million light years away. If you can discover something right next to you, you can't see. That's pretty good. <laughs> oh, I think I got a black hole right here. <laughs> it even gets better. How do we discover it? We use the Hubble telescope to discover a black hole that you can't see. I would have loved to have been with the scientists when they got those pictures from the Hubble. <laughs> you know what, I can't see anything. <laughs> Let's just tell them it's a black hole. <laughs> a British scientist, whoa! All right, so if you have any questions, no, Fred Clit is quite a riot. Yeah, that was hilarious. Good point, though, you know, that sometimes they tell us things that go over our head, but they don't make any sense at all. Yeah. And we just swallow it because these are reputable, world-class scientists with their multiple PhDs, but they still talk crap, yeah. just like us. Yeah. Nonsense is nonsense, no matter who talks it. Yeah. So we have to just criticize and analyze everybody. All right, any questions that might have come out from... Uh, the presenter's uh, video. I might not be able to answer it, but I'll at least try. I, I, I like how um, you use the word uh, fine-tuned. Fine-tuning is, is a key argument yeah. for, from creationists because if the world is designed, it has to have been designed very well so that life can come on earth and life can continue on earth. And, and that's where the genius of God comes in. Exactly. I mean, if it's just a book of chance thing, the numbers could be random and therefore life would not come to be. Yeah. Nor would it be sustained by random numbers. The numbers have to be extremely intricately precise. precise. And that's where God's omniscience comes in. And he mentioned it, but I remember one thing I was I'll never forget, I remember how old I was, but I was I was young teen, maybe even younger, at at uh our piano teacher's home, and she has some magazines on a coffee table while I'm waiting for my turn. And when I read through it, I happened to have an article by, uh, and I never heard of, it, heard of them at the time, uh, Creation uh, I don't remember the name mm -hmm. of the person, but it was, uh, I remember the, them using the term creation scientist. 
Okay. So, um, and the one thing that stuck with me all even till now was that Big Bang is he didn't say foolishness, but basically could not have happened because just look at the Earth's axis. So if you go one degree this way, you mm-hmm. burn. You go one degree this way, you freeze. Yeah. So it's like, you know, and that always stuck with me that no matter what they tried to throw at me, even as a child, a big bang, that's all I needed. One degree, mm-hmm. not 45 degrees or yeah. 30 degrees, one degree. Worries. You know, and, you know, you're either frozen or you're burned up. That's mm-hmm. it. So, you know, I like how he used that as far as, as even in the sun, in the universe and in the earth, everything is fine tuned, precise, fine tuned and precise. Yeah. For for you know to sustain us here on earth and to show God's glory. As the privileged well. planet is going to um, support that as well. Lovely video. Mm-hmm. I, I'm crazy as a pastor, and I tell colleagues, I say, colleagues, we don't have to preach every Sunday morning. Take a video like the privileged planet, show it, and let the people appreciate science from a and these are people in there who are not Christians themselves, not creationists, but they're just showing the science that they have studied. Mm-hmm. And you are amazed at the fantastic fine tuning of the universe and of Earth. And so people can ask questions at the end, and we can close with a little, if you, if needs be a little, you know, a little epi, uh, what do you call it? Q and A. Sorry. Q and A. A Q and A, yes, or you know, a little, a little slight point talk at the end or nothing just do q a and pray it's really revolutionary invite by the way the students who are studying science in high school upper high school or college let them come to bible study next week tell them we're going to be showing the privileged planet a scientific presentation which will help them in their science projects at school fascinating dvd years ago the illustra media people who have produced it we're giving it away free because they wanted it to be used across the globe in science classes to bolster Christian students who are studying science that they are not hoodwinked, thinking that if you believe in the Bible's perspective on creation, then you have to hide your head in your in the sand or whatever. Hmm. Absolutely fascinating. We'll show you that next week, and then following that, the following week, God, I, my sense of God, nature's everything on some of the issues of the planet. Any question, anybody, from Dr. Safati's presentation? No, I, I like, you know, and how he, he kind of brought up the, um, so you have that black guy who, who sounds like he's like the most intelligent person in the world, Neil deGrasse the black Tyson. What's his name, right? Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, and I want a French man. Astrophysicist, superbly bright. Yeah, brilliant. but he has yeah. no regard for God. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't. I mention him in my. I mention him in my in my public lecture on the existence of God. Mm-hmm. You'll hear me mention him and chide him a little bit that he as a an astrophysicist could only do science because God has created a a precise, fine tuned world that is orderly. Right. I mean, just but that's like what he was saying. The the guy in the video was saying how. Um, his argument kind of defeats itself. Yeah. You know, where, you know, they're saying how the gas pressures or whatever from all these nebular clouds or whatnot mm. would prevent the forming of stars. That's itself. right. That's right. They would have serious problems. Theory. And the you honest know. ones who are scientists, non, are non, non-religious non scientists, they're more and more, they're coming out in public saying, no, this thing can't work at all. We have to see come up with another plan B in terms of how we explain the origin of the universe and the fine tuning in the universe. Yep. So, you know, and, and like you said, you have these, you have people out there who either they don't know or they don't care, but they take these people's word as gospel. Oh, yeah. Look oh, into yeah. It. But no matter how, I mean, just, just in him playing the, you know, or reading the quote that he said. From these scientists. From, yeah. You can see even within the quote himself, he's contradicting himself. That's right. That's you right. And, and I remember from when we first, you know, earlier on we were doing uh, the thing with Darwin. Darwin left that at near the end of his his theory for evolution that, hey, 
I'm this is my thoughts. Maybe somebody will come behind and prove me wrong. And he yes. also made a statement which says, if there's any organism that cannot have developed by the slow um, changes that he predicts, his theory will be, will be rubbished. Right. But now we are seeing that you have, for certain organisms and entities, you have to have all of the particulars there at once. They can't gradually. Right. And the most trap is what they use as a non-biological example of what they call irreducible complexity. All of the parts have to be there. Otherwise, the entity cannot function at all. Yep. 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 All right. Well, guys, much to ponder. Yeah, definitely. Are you mind closing us out, Rev? Yeah, let, let's pray. Oh, Our Father, we... Okay, go ahead, Rev. Sorry. Our Father, we thank you for having been with us yet another night in our Bible study. As we probe your word, Lord, may we consider deepening our confidence in your word, trusting your word supremely above all else. No man is as bright as you are, O Lord, and no one knows all that you know. So let's just bank that your word cannot be faulted by puny, finite scientists. So encourage us with the confidence in your word, and Father, we pray above all things, we might not only learn your word, but we might live the truths of your word so that others might see Jesus Christ shining through us. Bless us now as we go. Rest our brains and our bodies in good sleep and use us wherever you please tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a good right, night, everybody. guys. Stay safe, Lord everybody. Bless. Good night. Okay, God bless. <laughs> Next week. <Yeah. laughs>